because I was broke, man. I had student loan debt. I had child support bill. I was paying for her apartment. I was also paying for my apartment. I had to feed myself and I had racked up a lot of credit card debt because it was an industry downturn and nobody was hiring for about six months. And so I had to live off of credit cards. And so my credit was shot and all these things were going wrong. And the only answer I had was the things that I learned from my parents was put your head down and get to work. Like that's the only answer you have. Even think about this, like when you go out in the world and you separate from your kids, especially if they're young kids, like one, two, three years old type, man, it, it's going to hurt your, your single game, you know, and that's going to hurt your ego. Like if you're going to try to meet somebody and go, Hey, I got a kid that's one year old over here. What do you think they're going to think? Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Chief here, the professional problem solver, coming to you live for another episode of The Overcomers. We have an amazing guest today, Mr. Tony Watley. He's a 20-year serial entrepreneur, business coach, best-selling author, podcast host, and a speaker. He's a co-founder of LS1 Tech, an online automotive performance community, which grew into the largest of its kind. The website grew to over 300,000 registered members and 150 advertising accounts and was uh, later sold for millions in only five years. Amazingly, it was just his part-time business. So uh, imagine what his full-time business looks like. Tony shares his mindset and business strategies with the uh, Amazon, with, with his number one Amazon best-selling book, Site Hustle Millionaire. Uh, you can go ahead and uh, purchase that right now, put it in your cart, and in that book, Tony teaches people how to start up, scale, and exit their companies. With his previous oil gas profession, managing hundred plus million dollars international projects, he consults small businesses on how to benefit from his expertise in processes, systems, and leaderships. His purpose is to help people gain the knowledge and courage to take action. He strives to help others become the best version of themselves uh, when not performing the work that he loves. You can usually find Tommy and his wife, Lisa, traveling the world or racing cool cars. Without further ado, we don't want to waste any more time. I just want to introduce you to Tony Watley. Welcome. Hey, thank you, Velko. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to have you on our podcast. Thanks for accepting, Tony. And by tradition, we start with uh, the question of heritage. So I want to find out if you could take us back to your parents' parents, to your grandparents. We oh. believe that there's a ripple effect. And sometimes right. we continue our grandparents' missions or sometimes we learn principles from them. So the question is, uh, who are your grandparents? And both from your mom's side and your dad's side, what are some warnings and examples that you remember from them, some good principles and some things that you uh, told yourself I'm going to avoid making the same mistake. Got it. So my mom is Japanese immigrant. So my Japanese grandparents were farmers and they worked in, they owned fruit orchards. So they just you know, basically picked and sold fruit. That was kind of their career. Hard work. You know, they, they were middle class income at that level. And, you know, I never got to meet my grandfather. He passed away before I was born, but I got to meet my grandmother once when I was about 12 years old. And, you know, she was just like an older version of my mom, but she just worked really hard and was kind of quiet and very stoic. And so I don't really have a lot of lessons from them. I didn't really have a lot of connection to the Japanese family, them being so far away. My American grandparents were from Louisiana and they were 
people that were just worked really extremely hard their entire lives and they never really made any money. They were always kind of just struggling financially. And so they were always moving city to city when my dad was young to find work. And my grandfather was a, someone that worked in the chemical refineries. And so they just moved wherever the work was. And so my dad, I think went to 20 different high schools when he was young wow. and it really upset him and his brother because they would make friends or get a girlfriend and then they would have to move all the time. And so when I grew up, my dad decided he was never going to move while my sister and I were in school. And so we grew up and stayed in the entire you know, one city the entire time, Friendswood, Texas, a suburb of Houston. My mom is a Japanese immigrant, like I said, and when she came over, my dad was a uh, Vietnam vet, U.S. Marine, and she worked in the public schools her entire career as a cafeteria lady serving food to kids and where my dad followed in his father's footsteps and worked in the chemical refineries his entire career. Wow. What an incredible story. Uh, so your dad had a warning that he followed on. He was like, I'm never moving my kids. That's right. And um, I can I can count from one to ten in Japanese. That's about it. Do you speak Japanese? Or? No, I don't. No. You never learned from your mom? Your mom? No, she was too busy trying to learn English, and so I learned English from a Japanese woman. That's why I still mispronounce things sometimes. So I learned English from watching Sesame Street and from a Japanese woman. Who was your favorite character in Sesame Street? Uh, probably Big Bird or just someone that just. You know, they were all kind of, I like the Oscar the Grouch. I like Cookie Monster. They were all, they're all fun when you're a kid. Yeah. Yeah. We all grew up with these guys. Are they still around? Sesame Street? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. There were some scandals with uh, Elmo. <laughs> like yeah. Elmo came later. Like we, Elmo didn't even exist when I was little. Yeah. Yeah. There was a um, scandal with the original voice of Elmo. Hmm. I guess child molester or something like that. <laughs> no. Well, it's called Tickle Me Elmo. So, I mean, come on. I mean, it, or yeah, the story writes itself. In retrospect, I was like, holy smokes, all these, all these lines he was saying. Mental. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, about your parents, um, you, you kind of shared with them. Tell me a little bit about your um, high school times. High school, I was just, I, I was an athlete. I was a straight A student, top 10% student. I worked exceptionally hard to get grades and, and also play football and you know, wrestling and, and any kind of contact sports. So I've always been a very daredevil type personality, willing to take risks or put myself in risk of bodily harm. And I still do that still today. I'm 51 and I still go skateboarding and half pipes and bowls now. And I, and I like to lift a lot of heavy weights now. So I like to race cars and go over 200 miles per hour on the track. So I've always been not really an adrenaline junkie, but I just enjoy like the, the fear and, and pushing against things that people are normally afraid of. Yeah. I were very similar in that sense. I love speed mm -hmm. and I always challenge myself to step into fear. So what's your uh, favorite car to go over 200 miles with? The only one I've done it is a Dodge Viper that I built that's about 1,200 horsepower. So I've got a couple of those. One of them I used for the road course. And the other one was made for straight line you know, events like runway strips or drag strips. And so, yeah, it went uh, in a standing mile from zero to one mile. It went 209. Wow. I I used to sell Vipers and SRT products. Nice. So I was uh, I was an expert in those, in the Mopar muscle. Nice. And the first time I got, I drove with 165 was in a Viper. But All I right. think, um, it was like on a track, so there was cornering. It wasn't like mm -hmm. a straight track. And when I drove the Hellcat, when it first came out, I was a little more scared than the Viper. This thing was like out of control. And what I hear now is there's even faster, like Demon and everything else. So I could only imagine how that thing feels. Just yeah. the incredible amount of torque. The Viper had like 600 foot pounds of torque. Yeah. So that, that's when they're not modified. Mine was supercharged and yeah, yeah built engine. So probably about a thousand foot pounds of torque. Yeah. That's a crazy feeling. Just take off. It's yeah. Like insane feeling. Even for people who are just riding, people who are just. Oh, yeah. 
You know, when people hear these numbers and they go, well, how do you drive that? Well, the thing is, is a throttle pedal has a travel range. So if you're not flooring it, it's not a thousand horsepower. But, you know, if you give it 50% throttle, it's 500 horsepower, if you kind of think of it that way. So you can still drive these big horsepower cars around. You just don't mash the throttle all the way down. Yeah. And if you if you can only imagine, like, when we were kids, we were impressed by 300 horsepower. Oh, yeah. And now they're Mustang like, GT, 5.0 Mustang Fox body, 225 horsepower, and everybody thought they were fast. Right. And now these things are like street legal 1,000 horsepower. Just yeah. Sold stock like that. Yeah. Whoa. How far we've come with speed and pushing the boundaries. And I remember when Bugatti was a, um, the first three-second car, mm -hmm. and now you can find so many three-second cars. Yeah. 100 grand. It's like wow so are you a fan of this luxury fast cars or do you prefer pure muscle i'm a car enthusiast through and through so i'm not specifically brand loyal i have several different cars and i've always had different variety i tend to favor specific products individual make and models and years and specs and I can also appreciate why each vehicle exists for the intended purpose. Right. So somebody may, you know, I've got a TRX Ram TRX. It's got the Hellcat engine, like you say, you know, and, and I like the truck. It's a 702 horsepower truck and I drive it every day. It's fast. But then people will say, why don't you modify it? Make it go faster. And I say, because if, even if I modify this TRX to go faster, it's still going to be sl much slower than my cars. So right. why would I do that? So I, I understand like the TRX is like a big truck. It's a toy. It's got an off-road type, you know, high speed suspension for going off-roading. It's designed for a very specific purpose. I'm not worried about making that truck faster. It's fast enough, right? Yeah. And when I look at something that's in an economy car or an EV or just something that is created to make hyper miles per gallon, I can respect why that's built and why it exists. doesn't mean I have to own it, but I, I can respect it. Do you uh, remember the first Ford Lightning? Yes. What do you think about the new one, the EV Lightning? It's terrible. It? It's terrible. It's boring looking. It's to me, it actually looks worse than a normal F one hundred and fifty. And I just, I think they did it the name a disservice. They should have made it more sporty looking. I think if they would have put the Raptor body on it and just made it a two wheel drive version of the Raptor, a little bit sportier, wider body, and then put the EV drivetrain in it and called it a lightning because the original lightnings were rear wheel drive high performance sport trucks standard cab and then they made this a quad cab and a boring flat sides and a flat front end and i think they should have done it more sporty yeah i agree with you but ford is in trouble you know they're one of these zombie companies that are just borrowing money to stay alive i just borrowed nine billion to make these ev cars and they're not selling well like especially mm -hmm. the mustang is struggling hard what do you think about the whole ev shift i i think that the technology is fascinating but i think that the government trying to mandate evs and force people to buy evs and also giving people subsidies and discounts and tax breaks to buy evs i think that's terrible because we all know that they get charged up by the same electrical plants and coal burning plants and fossil fuel plants are generating the power for these things. They're not really self-sustainable. And whenever I think about business or any kind of industry that's being subsidized by the government, that really removes a fair market competition because if you're getting incentives and, and tax incentives and discounts and things like that to buy something, that means it can't stand on its own. It can't compete on the same market. And if it's not a net positive on the environmental factors and all these things that they talk about, then it's really just a bunch of marketing hype. I think the technology and the speed and the acceleration are very fascinating, but I don't think the battery technology is, is, is come enough far enough. I mean, we see these fires that happen and you can't put them out. No amount of water can put these fires out. They'll just sit there and melt down the entire car. It's just crazy to watch that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of safety things and a lot of charging limitations right now. I know it will improve 10 years yeah. from now, all these problems will be solved, but right now, it's still in the infancy. You know, as a car guy, I I appreciate the smell of gasoline and the stick shift. And the, the engine sounds. The vibration, the sound of the engine. So mm -hmm. 
I'm going to have a hard time letting go of this stuff. Yeah. But I think eventually, like you said, they're going to clear the problems and, and they will win. And they want to go. What's even scarier is they want to go after driverless cars. Mm -hmm. So just sit in the car and you're not even in control. And to drivers, that's like a nightmare. And just like exotic cars and muscle cars, now you got to go to a track to drive mm -hmm. them. The way I see the future is probably we're probably going to be able to drive these cars only on like tracks, kind of like when when they dehorsed us in the twenties. <laughs> Uh, you can still ride a horse, but just not on, not highway. on the highway. Yeah, and and I think the same thing is coming. Unfortunately, inevitable. And they're gonna sell us with safety. They're gonna be like, oh, now to avoid accidents, they're gonna start showing accidents everywhere. And there's plenty of those because of mm -hmm. the texting, kind of like they're showing the trying to get rid of guns and stuff. And they're gonna flood the the news with terrible accidents and be like. If we have EVs, we can avoid this accident. So if you, you know, EV, like the self-driving features, I've, I've ridden in a few. I've driven the Tesla Plaid with the self-driving. The technology is pretty cool right now. But where the problem is, is in, if you live anywhere where there's road construction, which I'm in Houston, there's always road construction. Yeah. The lanes are not always the same every other day. You drive down the same stretch of freeway one week and then next week it's some other configuration and those stripes are zigzagging and and so whenever you get in this construction zone sometimes the stripes are overlapping the old stripes and it's very confusing to these these cameras and they're just like what the car kind of wigs out and like doesn't know which stripe to follow and that's kind of that's unnerving yeah. so i think if there was a world of, of a perfect world where there was zero construction and the roads were always the same then self-driving would actually be pretty cool like for most people um, we all know that especially in the Houston area, we got a lot of you know, illegal drivers and illegal immigrants that come from Mexico and they, they have really bad driving habits down there. It's like whoever honks first has the right of way. They don't understand all the, the laws. They don't have insurance and they're just zigzagging. And so it's crazy sometimes. So I would rather those people be in self-driving cars that way they don't have to drive so horrible. Yeah. No, I think we, it's going to be inevitable. Like the commercials right now, are all about self-driving cars. They're yeah. like trying to prepare us for it. Yeah. Well, we're still going to go on track and drive our cars. It's going to be a premium thing. Yeah. Just like it is now. Like if you have a nice car, you got to rent a space, rent a garage, pay. It's a premium. It's a luxury service. But um, tell me, let's go back to uh, your story. Tell me a little bit about um, your first love. Oh man, I would say first love would probably be one of my high school girlfriends. And I, it's just, you know, you always knew it's temporary, but it's more about infatuation or trying to f figure out relationships or figure out how to communicate with someone. And, you know, fortunately I grew up with a sister, so I kind of knew how women, you know, communicate and they were a little bit more emotional than, than men and, you know, what upsets them. And so I, you know, I had a, you know, being raised with my mom and, and a sister really, I think helps, I think men who don't grow up with other women in the house probably have a play a little catch up probably waste a few years and make a lot of bad decisions before they learn how to communicate but yeah I, yeah i think even my very first girlfriend you know we knew that it was a temporary thing neither of us thought it was like this is going to last forever so we just kind of enjoyed it for the moment that it was this is a really good point that you can learn from your mom and sister mm -hmm. and get some tips as well on what women like what women want mm -hmm. Communication is completely different. So learning that is is a key. Tell me, uh, what are the three biggest challenges in your life? What what are the three main moments of adversity that you felt this is like the worst thing in my life? The worst the worst hmm. thing in my life. And I, I'm, I'm the really only one that really comes up is when I became a father in year 2000. I was in a relationship that really wasn't a good relationship. And we were just, you know, a, a pair of people that would just go out and party together and do things like that. But we really weren't in a loving relationship. It was actually a really short you know, relationship at that time. You know, we trusted that birth control worked. We were both being safe, but her, her uh, birth control pills, we didn't understand that those things fail when you do antibiotics. Mm. So 
she had her wisdom teeth removed and she was on antibiotics and she got pregnant during that period. And we were like, we were both like, you know, what's going on. And then we learned from the doctor, like, yeah, if you're on antibiotics, like your birth control gets, you know, canceled. So anybody watching this or learning this, like you better know that because if somebody gets the flu or gets sick and they go get antibiotics, like, and they're on birth control and they trust it, it, it doesn't work at that point. So, you know, so we had, we decided that we were going to keep the kid and, and raise him. And, you know, we were never married or anything like that. And I was living with her and it was just a really, it was a hard relationship. We were just had such different core values and different things. And she was really unsupportive of the, the career and the, the businesses that I wanted to create. And she would make fun of me building these websites and stuff like that and say that was a waste of time and cars are a waste of time. And, you know, I just, and I've always been a car fanatic since I was like a kid, as long as I can remember. And I was wanting to start businesses and she's like, that's stupid. And so eventually I was like, the only thing that was keeping me there was my son. And I think that a lot of people can relate to that. They stay in relationships way too long for the sake of their children, they think. But, you know, it came to a boiling point around, you know, late 2000. And I just decided, you know, she was, she was getting at me one day and she's like, you know, you need to get out of here. And I was like, okay. So she left out of town and, and I told her father and her mother, was like, when you guys get back, I won't be here. And I, and I was just, it was the hardest decision I ever had to make, but it was always the best decision I made because I could tell like that entire year and a half, I was living in a depressive cycle. I just felt like I was going through the motions. I didn't really feel like myself. I felt like my life was out of control. I felt that I was in a, stuck in a relationship with a woman that I wasn't in love with that I didn't even like. And I just felt like everything up to that point, and I just graduated college and had gotten an engineering job and all these things were going positive for me. Then this thing happened and being stuck and I felt trapped. And I just remember not remembering the, the commutes to work. I would get in my truck and I'd wake up basically at my desk and not remember like from A to B, then it's kind of the same way going home. So it was always like you were just going through the motions. I was self-driving, you know, I was like not really thinking about that. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, when I split up and I was actually driving to go find my own apartment again, I felt this release of just, I felt like such a, a lot of energy just came back to me. I felt that I'd made the right decision. I started to feel like I was seeing color again, you know, like it just felt like I started to kind of wake up out of that funk for a year and a half. And I never looked back and I never, you know, tried to get back with her. I just said, you know, I'm, I'm going to be a father. I'll be the weekend dad and I will pay you the child support just like the I'm supposed to. I was maxed out on the child support, you know, for the state of Texas. And, you know, so I was weekend dad for for most of his life. And, you know, we have a great relationship. My son will be 24 in January. So it's been a while. But in the midst of that, 2001 is when I started that company that you mentioned in the intro that grew to millions of dollars. And while I was kind of going through that struggle, nobody really knew that except for my family and maybe some close friends. But everybody else thought, you know, he's upbeat and he's positive. And I was good at hiding the emotions that I was kind of struggling through. And even with an engineering job, I would still go wait tables at a restaurant seven nights a week. So I get off from my engineering job. I put on my apron and go back to work and I'd get home at midnight and I'd sleep and I'd just repeat that every single day. And even on Saturday mornings, I was a mechanic and I'd work at a performance shop and help them with sales and, and wrenching on cars because I was broke, man. I had student loan debt. I had child support bill. I was paying for her apartment. I was also paying for my apartment. I had to feed myself and I had racked up a lot of credit card debt because it was an industry downturn and nobody was hiring for about six months. And so I had to live off of credit cards. And so my credit was shot and all these things were going wrong. And the only answer I had was the things that I learned from my parents was put your head down and get to work. Like that's the only answer you have. A lot of people will just nowadays go on Facebook and complain about it and put a GoFundMe yeah. or hand, handouts. They want free shit. I just said, Hey, you know what? I'm going to get another job. And I'm going to get another job and then I'm going to still do things on the side. And I was learning new skills, like how to code websites, how to build websites, because I knew that that was kind of the future. And I started building websites for local businesses and things like that. And, and that kind of gave me a few extra hundred bucks here and there. And so I did that for really two years, even after I started that business and it started to cash flow probably $10,000 a month. I was still so far behind that I just kept waiting tables and I was still building this website and you know, I did that for two more years and people would see me, they would see me at this restaurant 
And it was sometimes the people at the engineering job would see me and they didn't realize I was doing that. And they would see me and they say, Hey, Tony, why are you waiting tables? You're an engineer. Like you, we report to you at the company. I say, like, because I'm not where I want to be and I'm willing to go to do what it takes. And you know, they, they admired that. They're like, wow, that's, that's pretty crazy work ethic. Most people would think, well, I have an engineering degree and I have an engineering salary. So I'm a big boy and I'm, I would never do the waiting tables thing that's beneath me, you know, cause a lot of people are doing that kind of stuff nowadays. They're not doing what it takes. And I was always willing to do what it takes. And so that's kind of my work ethic and not worrying about what people think. I can relate to you in such a close way. Um, I think that our children are our biggest blessing and I love my children and my daughter, but I was in the same type of relationship when she was born. So, um, same exact situation. And during the time when we were together, I was very successful car salesman making a lot of money and I wanted to start a business on my own. She laughed at me. And when I really needed the most support, I, I didn't receive it, but, uh, uh, I went through hell with this relationship. So when you said some people stay for the sake of the kids, I stayed for like three years. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was a very, very bad uh, period of my life and still, still going through it. Kind of my daughter is only 12, but, but I can relate so deeply with what you went through and, and what I went through to take care of, child support and building a business at the same time mm -hmm. uh, dealing with your own egos your your um shame your embarrassment yeah when when you when you're a man and you have integrity and we are socially conditioned that if we leave the house and we leave the children behind you get the label of uh deadbeat dad and you know just you know unapproachable dad like there are all these negative stigmas and and for the right reason some people are like that they are deadbeats they're not really taking care of their kids and i remember having that conversation with my parents before i decided to move out and they said well you will be a deadbeat dad if you don't pay for child support you will be a deadbeat dad if you don't visit your child and interact with your child and raise your child as your your father like that's what a deadbeat is so it's like if you don't do that then you're not a deadbeat and so I was glad that I could hear that from my parents and realize, okay, they're not going to judge me as long as I do the right thing. So it yeah. doesn't mean that I have to be in that relationship. So it was one of those big decisions like, man, I'm going to be labeled. And even think about this, like when you go out in the world and you separate from your kids, especially if they're young kids, like one, two, three years old type, you know, toddlers, man, it, it's going to hurt your, your single game, you know, and that's going to hurt your ego. Like if you're going to try to meet somebody and go, Hey, I got a kid that's one year old over here. What do you think they're going to think? They're going to think, oh, you're you're like a deadbeat. You left a woman with a little baby, you know, because the social stigma that we adopt, it's a hard. It's a it's a hard identity to carry. And, you know, for about a year and a half, I wasn't even interested in meeting another woman when I moved out because of that. So that's kind of the things that we had to go through. And it sucks. Yeah, I was single for like three or four years. And with my the only difference is I always had 50 50 with with my daughter, but yeah. we were never married and I still am the only one paying child support. But, um, mm -hmm. as long as I have the opportunity to build relationship and yeah. be in a strong relationship with my daughter, that's, that's what matters to me. And it's just very difficult because this is a lifelong decision, you know? So mm -hmm. having a child with the wrong woman, it's probably one of the biggest mistakes man can do not the child the child is an no. amazing blessing but that 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 relationship you get stuck in until they're 18 and it could be right. detrimental yeah yeah it could be really really detrimental and we either uh get something positive out of it and build an amazing business an amazing life mm -hmm. or some some dudes get crushed some dudes turn to drugs alcohol and yeah. kill the pain with something else and it's really really bad and they do become that be dads especially in chicago mm -hmm. there are so many the judge on our case kind of told me openly i've already made up my mind and you're going to pay the price for all the all the dead beat dads <laughs> that's what they do if they find that one is financially responsible they basically punish you for everybody else you know and that's responsibility i, I gladly took it i never complained about it and then never paid late i never did that kind of game i just uh 
we didn't even have to go through the system because we knew what the maximum that I was going to have to pay. I just cut her a check every, every month, you know, and there was no complaints about that kind of stuff. So, but I agree. Like, I think that I would not have become as successful in business had I not been in that period of my life, because for me, learning that new skill, which was graphic design and, and photography and HTML coding and building web pages, that was my outlet because my life sucked so bad. And I just needed some kind of a creative outlet to focus on. And had I not been in that situation and I was that age, you know, twenties, still in my twenties, I probably would have still been partying and been out the bars every weekend and just wasting a lot of time and a lot of money with a bunch of people that don't mean anything. And so the fact that I couldn't afford to do that, and I knew that I had the responsibility of this new child, I focused any extra time I could into building the businesses and also investing in myself with new skills that I knew that could potentially make money. I wasn't dabbling in things as a hobby. I was learning how to do that to create more income because I got tired of being a waiter, man. I was about to be 30 years old. I was like, I don't want to be waiting tables in my thirties. It's like, I need to figure out how to do something where I can work from home, where I'm not having to commute to that second job. I'm not having to stay there for several hours dealing with people. I just want to be able to come home from my job and fire up the computer and crank out some stuff and make a few extra hundred bucks a, year, a month. And eventually that just grew and grew and grew. And so I would not have been that focused had I not been in that situation. Yeah, I agree with you. And the reason why I made this show, The Overcomers, is I want to help people, viewers, listeners who are going through the same um, struggles to see how overcoming looks like what it takes and to take practical steps based on our guests. And I think that every everything that happens to us, whether it's the worst emotional trauma you could go, like I've interviewed guys like uh, Ray uh, Cash Care. Mm -hmm. He had his dad murdered in front of him. You know, um, so many, so many terrible things. Like um, I interviewed Eddie Wilson a couple of weeks ago and he had lost his um, two of his siblings uh, growing up, and and just such an emotional uh, traumas. But they lead to us growing, and they lead to different blessings. So it's kind of like maturity to realize that everything terrible that happens in our life happens for us, not to us. Yeah. And, and there's always something beneficial that is born out of this. There's always something good. I, I waited tables myself, and um, and I remember clients. I stopped waiting tables when I was 22, but I remember clients saying, what are you doing here? And you probably got so oh, much. Yeah. So much you, you seem very smart. Why are you doing this still? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and that's, that's the part that's hard to swallow at the end of the shift. You're like, man, what am I doing here? Then you, you go back to it. But yeah, we're, we're not, we, you and I are not bashing being a waiter because you got to do what you got to do. Like we just talked about, if, if that's the only thing that fits your schedule and you can make an extra hundred, two hundred dollars a night, but you'd rather sit on the couch and complain about your financial situation, that's on you. I'd rather wait tables than be broke sitting on a couch. Oh, yeah. Not at all. I think, as a matter of fact, I think everyone must wait tables for yeah. this. They should earn, we should earn a license to use it to eat at a restaurant and you have to work retail or work in a restaurant before you're allowed to work in a tipping type scenario because people have really bad days and they come in and they try to take it out on the, the waiters and you know those are the worst people in the world. Yeah, I think it's the most ungrateful job. Just working in a restaurant in any position, it's like you're literally serving people. You're literally for, serving For $2 people. an hour. And it's such an ungrateful job, yeah. and yeah. Um, and people bring their negativity and they take mm -hmm. it on the waiters, and especially now, what I'm hearing now is that uh, fifty percent of Americans don't tip over fifteen percent, maybe because of the economy, maybe because people, well, you know, they shouldn't go out to eat where they have tipping then. Right, they should. They if you can't afford to tip, stay your ass at home, go to the grocery store, and buy stuff that's less expensive. We don't want you at the restaurants. Absolutely. It's just, it's wrong to, yeah. to stiff, to stiff your waiter. People don't realize that that's how waiters get paid, that they don't. Yeah. In the United States, the waiters only make between $2 and $3 an hour. So the tips are part of main, the main part of their income. Yeah. And they still have an expense to get to work, to mm -hmm. prepare their uniform, 
they have side work they have to do stuff yeah uh, to help the restaurant and it's just like the biggest slap in the face when when somebody genuinely serves you food <laughs> and now and, if they suck yeah. don't tip them you know let them know but give them good feedback if you have a waiter that's just terrible they're probably new or they're just not really good but you should give them constructive feedback you don't have to be rude about it just say hey you never came by and never even like the food was halfway cooked like the, you never filled up the drinks like point out the stuff that way when you do give them a crappy tip they know why that way they can have some measurable way of improving because a lot of times people will just tip the 15 percent regardless even if it's bad service and you're just reinforcing bad actions and bad behavior I, Sometimes I will give that 15%, but I'll let them know, like you can improve on a lot of things and I want them yeah. to know that. And I do too. My wife hates it when I do it, but <laughs> I take it personally. And, and my wife is, is such a people's pleaser that she, she will make it easy for them to wait on us. And when I say, Hey, this is not how I ordered this. Oh, why are you going through this? Why are you gonna? I'm like, I'm not just going to pay $60 for steak and be like, yeah. Uh, uh, make it easy for for the restaurant they're supposed to please me for the 400 percent markup that's right and, and i'm like i come from this uh trenches okay and few times people i've worked at nice restaurants and few times people i really sucked like i was very high uh standard waiter because i always consider myself as a salesperson not so mm -hmm. much the, when i see two people i'm like i'm gonna make sure they have the most remarkable experience with a restaurant and they're going to buy everything desserts the best meal yeah. bottle of wine bottle of wine drinks so I, I spent long time learning about what we're offering and presenting it in a way that it it their mouth is is full of desire to try it yeah so um i i enjoy waiters who do that who do mm -hmm. the same thing who make me want to spend more that's right and many times maybe three occasions i must have gone to work little hungover when I used to drink or just uh, going through depression or just being sloppy three or four occasions I've had and people over tipped me in those occasions that I remember mm -hmm. and they, they would give me like a hundred dollar bill and then I would realize I really sucked here or maybe I just had a high standard mm -hmm. but the grace uh, made me never let this happen again you know the mm -hmm. grace all right, I'm responsible for these people's experience. And maybe they over tip me to show me, hey, I know what you're going through. So yeah. I I do always give at least 20%. So most of, most of the time, yeah. 30%, sometimes 50%. Plus it's easier to calculate, let's be real. And, and I, used to, <laughs> yeah, right. I used to bless people. When people give me big tip, I was like, yeah. God bless you. I hope that something great happens to you. And yeah. because I used to do that, I'm sure that, I make some waiters days uh, when I over tip and, but I do give them a lesson for sure. Every single yeah. time I'm like, yeah. next time when you bring the water, do this, do this, I give them some game. And, um, and I think there is like servers and waiters. There's like order takers and people who really own salesmen, salespeople. Yeah. yeah. Because all of my fellow waiters, they hated me because I would make like four times more tips than that. That's it. So they would uh, complain to the manager and we would like, have the sales competitions. Remember, we would say like who could sell the yeah. most bottle of wine tonight, who could sell the most desserts tonight, who can sell most of the, the surf and turf steak specials yeah. tonight. And then they would give us an extra 50 bucks if whoever won the competition, I would win those all the time. Right. Or a free, time. Meal. <laughs> a free meal or something like that. Something yeah. like I'm already yeah. here. I'm at in. And all that stuff they teach you maximizes your income. So why wouldn't you do it? Why wouldn't you try to be the best waiter there? Yeah. And a lot of, and I'll tell them, give me the worst section. Give me like the corner two tops and I'll still make more money than everybody else. But it's, uh, it's just being, being a good steward of what you do. You know, there's yeah. the old saying, do your best no matter what you're doing. And, and a lot of people just use this job as a temporary fix and and they don't give it their best or they don't take the time to develop themselves a lot of times people underestimate how important this job is and and uh they don't they don't train very well but i think any waiter any given waiter, there's so many crises in sales right now COVID just destroyed salesmanship 
in a way. So mm -hmm. customer service is terrible anywhere you go, not just at restaurants. Um, and I think that learning interpersonal skills, body language, where, where the customer is pissed off, when the customer is happy, when kind of like observing, uh, I think it's a great school for, uh, my kids are definitely going to do it for sure. They're going to be waiting tables. We can, yeah, we, we can read people very quickly after you work at a restaurant. If you go work for at a restaurant for a year, you can read those nonverbal communication cues so much better than most people because we're interacting with dozens of people per night, every single night. You get a lot of reps with a lot of strangers. You have a lot of conversations with people you've never even seen before. And so you become very perceptive to the way they react or the way their eyebrow raises or how they smile or how they look at you. And you can also tell if you're going to get a good tip or not, just from how they react to your greeting, as simple as that, like the, the way you greet them and the way they react tells you a lot. And it's hard to save the ones that are really negative. So give an example. If, if I walked up to your table and I said, Hey, my name's Tony. I'll be taking care of you tonight. What can I get you to start with drink? And if they don't even look up from the menu and address you or acknowledge you and they just go tea. Yeah, exactly. You're like, this is not going to be a good tip just the way they responded like this is not going to be a good tip because they oh, didn't yeah. even take yeah they, they didn't even take the time to make eye contact with you acknowledge you as a human that just greeted them and they just said t right you're right <laughs> there's some there's some people that feel that they must treat waiters as a second category humans and i can't stand those people yeah you know just... this is good for business owners that are watching this or even in your if you're a hiring manager in corporate anytime you're interviewing someone for a key position that will be leading people always do the interview at a restaurant yeah always because observe how they treat the waiter and the busser and anybody else that comes to the table and the way they react to those people and the way they treat those people will tell you every single thing that you need to know about that person during that interview and and don't go to a super fancy restaurant just because, a regular restaurant right regular restaurant because the super fancy restaurants they're kind of intimidated of yeah, just just really a regular good. restaurant. And yeah. if they're the person that doesn't look up and greet the waiter and go, Hey, how are you doing today? Thanks for asking. Or if they're the person that says iced tea <laughs> or, or the busser comes by and they're like, I'm not done with that. Or, you know, just something, if they're showing any kind of rudeness or kind of like thinking they're above the people that are serving them, that is a character flaw that a lot of people don't have the self-awareness of and they are, they're not capable of hiding it. Yeah. I use so much of this industry. I, I, bar I, I bartended and waited tables for like four years. And I use so much in my trainings now, nowadays when I teach sales. And I even have my most famous close is the three waiters close where I, I don't have time to get into it. But basically when, when um, it's like a price objection. And mm -hmm. if I have proactively over delivered with the experience, then I bring the buyer into a story where they deal with three different types of waiters and the first type is the sloppy one that doesn't care the second type is the one that does everything right but doesn't have personality and the third type is the one that really helps you have the best experience and then i'll ask the buyer which waiter do you think i am and they'll be like well of course you're the waiter number three and i'm like well would you tip each waiter the same amount of money and then they'll be like no i'll tip the third waiter more i'm like well then lean on the pen and pay me what I'm asking for. <laughs> right. Uh, and one. I also um, used another thing for uh, specifically from waiting tables uh, about the restaurants. Because when I teach sales, some guys and gals would greet people and would be like, hey, man, how you doing today? Hey, dude. Hey, brother. Especially like the Gen Z now, mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't have the, the same... The social skills. The social skills and the same respect for the elderly for some yeah. reason. I feel like there's like, like we were raised with yes, sir, no, sir, ma'am, mm -hmm. all these things. And when I walk into a business like Best Buy or uh, car dealership or, or real estate office, whatever it is, and I'm like, hey, man, how you doing, man? What's up, brother? Hey, and I don't mind for us to talk. I talk like that as well, but let's get to know each other first, not on the first impression. Yeah. So, so I would stop people and I'll be like, imagine that you are spending $2,000 for lunch. You go to this particular restaurant and you bring your fiance or your mm -hmm. wife and this is your anniversary and, and it's not 
chump change. You've been saving up money for this. Like in your current situation, you're spending two grand. Yeah. And the waiter comes up and is like, hey, man, can I get you something to drink? How would you feel? And they're like, yeah. oh, I see like this guy, how this guy escaped the training process. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, I see what you're saying. I'm like, people are here spending 30, 40, 50, 100 grand. They deserve a little respect. They don't you can't treat them like, like a homeless person. So we learned all these things because you, when you're in a restaurant, ma'am, sir, you do this 100 times a day. You address yeah. everybody in the most respectful way. And you kind of build that muscle. And when you transfer it into business, like you have good interpersonal skills. You know mm -hmm. how to build common ground. You know how to make people laugh, how to give them universal compliment. So I think anybody that, that starts a business or sales job, they need to be waiter first. Yeah. Or just be a, get into sales. It's such a useful skill for your entire life. If you've never been in retail sales or sales or car sales or anything where you had to sell, like you're going to miss out on a lot of opportunities in life because every interaction we have is some form of sale or influence. And like you said, the better you are at reading people, the more comfortable you are at asking for the deal, you're going to get those opportunities in life, whether that's asking a, a woman to dance or go out with you or asking for a promotion or a pay raise. Like all these things are selling skills. Yeah. Did you ever get into selling cars or working with dealerships or doing something? No, I, I've done a lot of the, the car flipping and things like that. I would build project cars with sponsorships and then I would sell them online. And so I got really good at taking photos and doing really detailed write-ups on them and sell them. I write magazine articles on them and stuff like that. So I never worked at a car dealership as a business model, but I have sold probably 50 of my own cars. And you've bought a lot of cars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, What's your first conscious moment? When when do you when did you realize? All right, I'm a human being. I exist. What am I doing here? How old are you? Man, I don't know. That's a that's a really that's a really broad question. But I will say that I'm 51 now, and I would say that my 40s were like the decade of growing self awareness and learning to question everything. I mm -hmm. think that you know our purpose changes and it shifts throughout our entire lives. And that's how it should be. I don't think that it's fair when we ask someone in their twenties, like, what, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? And what's your purpose? And the big questions you can't even comprehend when you're in your twenties, don't even pretend it. That's why I call it also kind of life laugh when there's like life coaches in their twenties, like you don't have your shit together. You have like, you don't, you, there's no way you can comprehend your, your life, much less anybody else's life. And so, you know, you think about this progression when, you talk about high school, high school, you're, you're trying to fit in socially. You're trying to learn how to communicate. You're trying to maybe get a relationship. You're, you're just trying to fit in and try to try to just do the best you can. Twenties for, I'm only going to speak in, in regards of men because I can't think what women think, but yeah. in, in your twenties, most driven men are focused on education and learning new skills or new knowledge to be able to create more money because we're really focused on making money. It's how we're raised. And then you start to get that education. You start to get those first career type jo jobs and you get a little bit more experience. So then you hit 30 and you have that experience behind you. And for most men in their thirties, it's all about how do I stack money? How do I just make as much money as possible? I've got the education, I've got the skill, I've got the, the time. And sometimes you have that family also driving you to push a little harder to see how much you can produce. And so that's when you're, you know, you're sacrificing your time from home. You're sacrificing your body physically by doing some of these jobs. And you're just all doing it for the, the sake of making money for most men. That's how we're kind of wired. And then you hit 40 and you go, wow, I could have done a lot of things better. I could have done things so much more efficient. I could have taken some of the lessons I know now and applied them back then. And it would have made my life a lot more peaceful, or a lot more stress-free. And, you know, so for 40s, I started thinking about the things I could have done better in my 30s and I could have been more present with my kid and present with my relationships. I could have uh, spent less money and made more bigger investments in, in companies and then also my own skills, because at that point I was already a multimillionaire and I was already kind of feeling comfortable in my, my around 34, 35. I started getting kind of complacent, started kind of gaining weight. I kind of got lazy. My house has got bigger. The cars filled up the driveway and I wasn't challenging myself anymore. And even when I look at my photos from back then, it was 15 years ago, I have like this fat face and 
got this gut kind of forming under my clothes and I would always wear like a baggy t-shirt to hide the stomach, you know, just, uh, I felt like I was an athlete in my mind, but every time I looked in the mirror, I felt like an old guy and I had the aches and pains that go along with that because I wasn't taking care of my body. And so I started, you know, at 39, I started thinking like, man, I'm about to be 40. That's a milestone age for most people, midlife, you know, halfway there, you know, that kind of stuff over the hill. And that's when I started really being focused on like, how do I improve? Like, how do I get back in shape? How do I start eating healthier? How do I stop drinking alcohol or doing things like that, that are hurting me in long term? And so I kind of went on that journey and, you know, most of my forties was just really self-improvement and understanding that I get what I put in and I get the result that I, I deserve, you know, whatever you have, you deserve. And so, I started questioning also beliefs and around religion or politics, a lot of things that people bake their identities into. They, they b- believe so strongly about things without realizing that had you just been born in a different country or with a different set of parents, even within the same country, a different zip code, you would probably believe equally strong about their beliefs or different beliefs that you have than your own. So when you start to realize that we are just humans that are programmed the things that we learn, our education, the things that we learn from our parents, our teachers, our friends, we're basically programmed. We're empty vessels that are programmed with a belief system. And you have to also question, okay, where do I want to be in the future? What lifestyle do I want to have? What, do I, what kind of impact do I want to create? What kind of legacy would I like to leave? And if you can clearly define those and visualize where you want to become, then you start to realize that some of the beliefs that we carry in our adult lives don't get us there. Like the beliefs that we carry are the ones that limit us and prevent us from growing to become that person that could achieve those things. And so I kind of started to free myself from a lot of labels, you know, Mm -hmm. like my dad being very conservative and a military vet, we're always Republican. Like we're, we vote Republican. I'm a moderate. I look at the social issues and I look at the financial issues completely different and I can see good and bad from both sides. Yeah. And so I've learned to really dislike extremists on both sides. And now on the left, the extremists are a little crazier right now than they've ever been. So they should get a little bit more dis- dissuaded to go do things that they are. They're just apeshit crazy a lot of times. But super high diehard conservatives where everything's a conspiracy and everything like they're they're kind of just loony. They're like kind of like the, the crazy uncle everybody has at the, at the Christmas party. And so being a moderate and not having to attach myself to either label gives me the freedom to decide what I want to do at any given time. And when people label themselves a certain way, even when we're talking about cars, like if you say like, I'm a Ford guy, like why would you label yourself that way? Yeah. Why can't you enjoy that Ford that you own? And maybe Dodge makes something cool like next year that you like, and you won't buy it because I'm a Ford guy. And all my friends will make fun of me if I'm a Ford guy. Guys, I built the biggest General Motors performance website on the internet. So if you want to label someone, I'm a GM guy, but if you go look at my garage right now, I've got six Mopars and one GM. And am I a Mopar guy? No, I just happen to like their products right now. So right now, they have yeah, quit labeling yourself with shit that limits you and keep the sovereignty to be able to decide what you want anytime you want. And it'll make your life a whole lot easier. Yeah, I agree. What are some belief systems that you carried uh, for the most of your life and you changed in while you're discovering yourself in your 40s. I think the the main one was the, the political the political leaning that we talked about. I think religion is another thing that people should question because I grew up with a Japanese mom who's Buddhist and a Southern Baptist dad. So I got to see two different philosophies and religion growing up. Most multiracial kids kind of see the same thing. Or if your parents were two different religions, you got to see both and one of the things that I really like is spirituality. I understand that I believe that there's something bigger out there. It could be God, it could be Buddha, whatever you want to decide. There's something out there that I think we all should believe because that gives us some level of purpose, hope. It kind of drives us to become better people because, you know, should we get the chance to move on to a better place? You want to make sure that you live the, the life that you were gratefully given here the best you can. Now, what I don't like is the organized religion where it's like it's like sports teams, man. Right. People get super offended about their team being insulted and their team lost the game and they, it ruins their their week, you know, until the next game. And you know, growing up Southern Baptist, they kind of have the reputation of 
you know, tarnation, damnation and hellfire, you know, like there's kind of like, if you're not, if you're not one of us, like all of them are going to go burn in hell because they're not us. You know, that whole team versus team thing, biggest crock of bullshit ever. And you think about in history, all the major wars in history were driven by religion. So you have something that was intended to be positive in our lives to help us with positive core values, treating people with respect, love, communication, all these things that are in the Bible, which was written by men, not the, the being. It was all created by men, but all with good intentions initially. And then everybody started coming out with their own versions of it because why? Because they wanted control. They wanted money. And they started to kill other people that had their own version of religion because those people weren't paying them their taxes, essentially. So they had no control or financial benefit for those people to exist. So that's when you started to see all these holy wars and religious wars going back thousands of years created by religion, by something that was supposed to be teaching you respect and love and compassion and being accepting and, you know, living your best lives and not being envious and all the good things that we should be focused on. So I hate that man ruined religion by making it organized and attaching it to money and power, which that's the human fault. That's what they all do for everything that we're given. So when I'm in Houston and we've got, you know, Joel Osteen, very popular, you know, TV preacher guys, his church is a multi-million dollar facility. It actually used to be the NBA stadium in the United in Houston. It used to be the Houston Rockets stadium. When they built the brand new stadium, he bought the former NBA stadium to be his church. And you're telling me that that's a nonprofit and that he's supposed to be doing great for the community. No, that's a pure money grab. We've seen aerial photos of his homes and all these different cars that he has. Like the dude's filthy rich and he never has to pay a cent of tax, but he's all here just to share the gospel. Like, I don't agree with that. Yeah. You can tell he's a little sleazy <laughs> in his presentation. There's even worse cases like the, in Atlanta, there is a guy named, uh, Pastor Dollar, he's got like a hundred million dollar plane and bigger property than Rick Ross. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but all these people, so what do you believe in now? Like spirituality, who do you, who do you thank? Who are you grateful to? Is, is it a specific? Without having a label, I would just use God. I would just God. use God. I just, um, uh... I mean, without having a label, just to be able to address someone, I think that your intentions do matter when you address things in those thoughts, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, who's to say that everybody that's been praying to God eventually gets to where we're, we're supposed to go and the guy's name is, is Billy Bob or something. He's like, I don't know why all these guys are calling me God. And, you know, my name is actually Billy Bob and, you know, everybody's been calling me God, but I get it. I know who you were talking to, right? So I don't think yeah. the name matters as much as understanding that there's likely a higher being. It may just be aliens. It may just, you know, it may be humans 500 years from now that have created us as kind of like the, like the test case over here on this planet. You know, when we think about UFOs and the government's even announced that they exist nowadays. They've confirmed that they exist. They've shown the videos. Like, are those really aliens? Or are those just human beings like from the future that have figured out how to come back and observe things? You know, you just don't know. We don't know these things. But you're convinced we have a creator. I think we have a creator. I just, I mean. Uh, what about Jesus? Jesus really hated religion too. I'm, I'm not. Religion. Yeah, I really didn't study too much. I've read the Bible, but I understand to me, Jesus was probably a very charismatic guy that told really great stories and he was very convincing. He was very influential. Sounds kind of like a politician when you think about that, like a very popular politician of that era. Anybody that really built a name for themselves in that era was someone that was willing to influence many, many people by sharing things. And so I think good intentions were a thing because he wasn't the guy that was trying to make get power and be, get rich. Right. You know, he was basically just trying to, you know, share what he believed in. And I think that's kind of what a politician would do until they get in the office and they get all greedy. Yeah. Well, look into him <laughs> when you get a chance mm -hmm. because um, he's got a very interesting, interesting story. Um, tell me about a moment in your life in the past that you can go back. You've seen Back to the Future. Mm -hmm. 
where you can go back and you could either alter that moment because you have control and knowledge of today and change the circumstances or you can just observe it one more time as a viewer you know i think that i wouldn't change anything because i'm very grateful and i've lived a fulfilling life up to this point but i would go back and i would have done things a little earlier you know one, mm. one of our greatest regrets is when we learn these lessons in life why didn't we take these actions sooner why didn't we implement these things sooner we we know it's solid advice but maybe it's uncomfortable for us to do it or maybe our ego is too big at the time and you know for me i was in my mid 40s when i finally joined a toastmasters and learned how to do public speaking and i got comfortable speaking on camera and stages and things like that. I had stage fright. I didn't like being in that situation. I was lived all of my life kind of in the background and you know, putting my work and my results in front of me and not really wanting any spotlight. You know, I've built a, a lot of successful businesses without having to be the face of the company. And so I was uncomfortable with that. And that was all based on insecurities and fear of judgment, just like everybody has. Right. Yeah. And so when I decided to write my book in 2018, I realized I needed to start preparing just in case I was going to get interviewed. And I you know, finally hired a speaking coach and joined Toastmasters, which is, a, you know, it's a nonprofit that teaches you public speaking and leadership skills. You have weekly meetings. And through the course of that, I found I actually enjoy doing this kind of stuff. I enjoy the public speaking. I enjoy learning how to communicate more effectively. And looking back, I wish I would have done that at age 18. I wish I would have learned to be a more effective communicator at age 18 and learn how to influence people at that age, because those skills would have greatly amplified my results for the rest of my life. So I basically took 20 plus years that I could have benefited from confidence, being able to put myself out there, learning how to communicate effectively, doing those kind of things. And, and um, I think that is some skill that everyone should have. And, we, we don't think we need it because we can talk that you and I can talk. So I don't need communication skills because you know what I'm saying and I know what you're saying. That's all we think about is talking is communication, but we don't understand that we can communicate with skillful influence and that is not the same as talking. And so when you're in salesmanship and things like that, it's, it's a different level of influence that everybody can use, but they don't have that skill. They don't have that awareness of what we're talking about. And, even when you build a company and you've got at 75 people on my staff, I've managed hundreds of millions of dollars in oil and gas projects with hundred people on my staff. I would lie to myself and say like, I don't need public speaking training because I've done hundreds of slideshow presentations and sales meetings. And I've done hundreds of, you know, you know, project kickoff meetings for my team. And I've done hundreds of state of the union type, you know, conferences for my team. And so I've, shown this tendency to have the occasional courage to stand in front of people and say things. So in my mind, that's what public speaking was. As long as you had the courage to occasionally say things in front of people, you can public speak. And that is the biggest lie there is. And that's the biggest lie that people tell themselves today, because unless you've been formally trained, formally trained in public speaking and understand the tactics of our voice, then I would argue that you are not a public speaker at all. It's nothing to do with the courage. The courage to me is just, a very small component of communication and public speaking. And you and I both will attend these business conferences, for example. I'm not talking about the ones that have the very established speakers, you know, Ed Milet, these big names. Like, I'm not talking about those conferences. I'm talking about the mid-tier ones where people are on the stage because they've done some kind of financial success. Maybe they become right. a multimillionaire, but they're kind of known, but not really known. And you'll see people get on the stage and they're horrendous. They're not good at all at speaking. Yeah. And they got slideshow up. I did twenty million dollars last year, and you're listening to them, and you just want to fall asleep. It's like, man, like that's awesome that you're successful, but you you don't deserve the stage of the microphone just because you've accomplished something. Because anytime we're on this microphone or a stage, you still have to be entertaining, and to become entertaining, you have to be trained in that skill set. So, had you interviewed me in 2016 before I started going on the journey? I lovingly look back at that version of me and I call that the monotony because I would have just been talking like this and just really monotone in one speaking voice. And I would have had no range in my voice. And this would have been just how men speak to each other. And I just not really comfortable about using my range or speed or control or things like that or dynamic voice range. And so 
when he learned gestures and eye contact and emphasizing things and not saying um and uh and all these distractions that make you seem uncertain or less confident or underprepared, all those things greatly impact the negative influence that you bring when you communicate. So I'm going on this really long because I kind of wanted to people understand, like, if you've never learned, go learn it. Even if you never plan on being on a stage or a microphone, if you learn how to communicate with influence and understand the tactics of using your voice and nonverbal cues, you will influence a lot of people to go out with you, give you a pay raise, consider you for a leader or a manager, help join a company and joint venture with you as a partner. Like all these things are very critical and everybody can do it. Everybody can do it. Yeah. And there's also levels to this um, because at first we, we get comfortable in front of our sales team. Then you speak in front of 20 people, then yep. you speak in front of 50 people, then you speak in front of 100 people. But the first time I spoke in front of 1,000 people, it was a totally different ball game. And I just remember my confidence being high. And as soon as I got on the stage and I saw everybody, I was like, <laughs> Well, that's, it's just lack of preparation. You weren't prepared for that mentally because yeah. had you been a sports athlete and you were in a big arena, if you were prepared, you would be confident stepping on that. Not, not because you've done it before, but you'd be prepared for that. So when we feel anxiety or nervousness when we're about to go on stage or on a microphone, it's because we have that self-doubt that's saying that we're not ready for this. We haven't done the reps. I'm going to forget what I'm going to talk about. Uh, you know, so all the self doubt starts to creep in and it's, it's a skill set that once you learn, you're okay and you're confident in your abilities. And also I think that when people speak on something that they're not really comfortable with or an expert in, that's also, that should, that should cause you some hesitation, right? Yeah. But if it's something that you're confident in and you're an expert in and you've studied it and you've done the research, that's when you should be speaking on those things because then you'll have all the confidence speaking on them. Yeah, that's what I think. I think that great speakers speak from their heart. Yes. And when you're sharing a story, you avoid those things that uh, in your speech that you mentioned earlier, it just kind of naturally flows. People are connecting with you. And you can tell when someone is not experienced because they have 32 slides in a 30 minutes and they're reading they're literally reading the slides to you <laughs> and you're like damn it i can read faster than you you're like just put the slide up and shut up yeah and it's so awkward because they have to turn around and read the slide and that's like, terrible what are you doing terrible, like, terrible. so but that's uh, the presentation mentality so you get people are like oh i've done all these slideshow presentations at corporate and i've done all these slideshow sales thing it's the thing is about this like if you're the boss right now this is where I was. This is where I was mentally. I was the boss. I had big teams. I was convinced that I didn't need public speaking training because I can occasionally say things in front of big crowds. And I've done all the slideshows. So that kind of self-validated me that I'd, I've done this before. I've closed millions and millions of dollars in deals. But the thing is, you start to realize that that audience was captive. They had to be there. They were reporting to you. They couldn't pull out their phone and start scrolling their phone or get up and go take a piss break in the middle of your speech. You had a captive audience and that doesn't count. Yeah. So now I've just shattered a bunch of egos. I hope people listening and watching this, like they hear that and they go, damn it. Damn, I never thought of that's me. Shit. You know? So guys, if you've never had formal training, a speaker coach or a Toastmasters, you are not a public speaker and you should get that training. So is Toastmasters uh, free or it's... Uh, it's almost free. It's like $90 for a year. Yeah, that's not bad at all. Yeah. So I definitely recommend it as well. Mm -hmm. And and then again, there's other levels like from 1,000 people going to Medicine Square Garden and speaking in front of 10,000 people, a whole different ball game again. I think it'll be the same. If you're prepared, to, if you can do a 1,000 pe person stage confidently, you'll do a 10,000 person stage because... Yeah. The nervousness, the energy we have is because we're too focused inwards on ourselves. We're worried about judgment. We're worried about, do I look okay? Am I going to remember what I had to say? Uh, is my voice okay? Do I have lint on my shirt? Like you're, you're too focused on yourself yeah. and that's what makes you nervous. When you take a stage or a microphone and intention to serve and pour into the audience, 
you're not focused on yourself anymore. You're there to be a vessel of information and energy to serve and pour into the audience. And when you can focus on serving them, it doesn't matter if that's one person or a million people. It's not because you're, I'm focused outward. I'm not worried about me. Worrying about yourself is what makes you nervous. Uh, one of the most amazing speakers that I've seen in person was uh, I went to like a Tony Robbins uh, workshop seminar. Mm -hmm. It was in the United Center. So it must have been over 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. And it was nine hours. This was <laughs> stuff for nine hours. Yeah. It was insane. But he felt the energy of the room. He felt it, it still felt like it was very well practiced as a speaker. Yeah observing that i'm like this is very well practiced it's done it and, thousands of times yeah yeah 30 years tony rum 30 years of that stuff who's your favorite speaker that you've seen live i would say the my favorite living speaker right now would be ed Milet, just because he knows how to tell a story and also bring the emotional highs and lows and he's a great storyteller in fact when i first you know came across him i was at 10x growth con in 2018 in vegas and I was there, I was in Lewis Howe's paid group and I knew Andy Frizzella from the car scene. And so I was glad that both of those guys were there. But Ed, to me, stole the show. Like there was a lot of big name speakers, Tim Grover, like a lot of big name yeah. speakers were at that event. And I knew of Ed, but I never heard him speak. And then after I heard him speak, I said, man, I'd like to learn from that guy someday. I really like to learn like that, that because I, I was, that was the time I was just getting into being a public speaker and I was taking the classes and I had a coach and I was taking more notes at that 10X about how they presented versus what they were saying. So I was kind of fascinated with how everybody was presenting. And and I put that out there and, and I was like, you know, I'd like to learn from that guy. And it was probably six months later is when Arte Syndicate was formed with Ed and Andy. And so those are the two guys I like and they're partnering up to create this thing and I'm still in it. It's been five years now. So, you know, to me, that was pretty cool that there was an opportunity and some of the private conversations I had around Ed or having him on my show was talking about speaking and communicating and things like that. And even, you know, podcasting and getting tips to be a better host. So, you know, be around and sometimes you got to pay a lot of money to be around these people, but if people can teach you things and accelerate your results, it's worth every, it's worth every penny. Oh yeah. Did you go to the last one in, uh, not the last one, but the one in St. Louis I think it was in March, the, the large, the live event. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I loved Ed's presentation there. It's good. Just, uh, he's able to bring vulnerability with humor and mm -hmm. deliver uh, practical information that you yep. can take home. That's right. I've been a fan of Ed for a long time. He's uh, he's one of my favorites as well. So, um, Tony, what are some things that you could share in closing um, as far as business principles? Because your passion is to help business owners to be more brave. Yeah. How can we encourage business owners right now in the last five minutes? Hmm, this is a tough one. Nowadays, I say that I'm more focused on scaling businesses and exiting businesses. Initially, I had a lot more clients that were focused on starting businesses. And when so I say starting... Practical steps to scaling. Practical steps to scaling. Okay. I would say that... You have to have your processes and your systems put in place. Most people do not. You'd be surprised. I've even worked with companies that were doing $10 million in revenue that did not have all their procedures and processes in place. It was all in the owner's mind and it was all in their employee's mind on their daily operating tasks. So if you can put those to pieces of paper and store them in your computer, basically where you have processes, what this does is it helps you save a lot of time when you're training on a new employee because if you could just point them to the database and go, hey, this is the role that you're going to do. Here's the roles and responsibilities. Here's the procedures for each of these tasks. Go ahead and start reviewing these things and spend a couple of days. I want you to really study these things and understand where the buttons you're pushing and the things that you're going to accomplish. And when you have questions at the end of this week, you know, come back, bring all the questions to me. We're going to knock this out in like in an hour. Most business owners do this the wrong way. They don't have these things documented, so they waste and there's turnover, like you talked about, bad employees, a lot of yeah. things right now, high turnover. So you're essentially babysitting a new employee for a couple of weeks because you don't have all your processes written down for them. So they're having to follow you around like a puppy dog trying to learn everything and know where everything is. If you just 
take a moment and write it all down and have that for them, have an employee handbook for their specific role that will save you hours and hours and hours of your productivity and also your time of training these people. So that's one of the main things. The other thing is understanding financial literacy with your business and cash flow management. The number one reason that businesses go out of business is because they are and they're not properly managing their cash flow. So you get into the situation where a lot of times people are having to sell new work to pay for the work that they already promised that they've been paid for, but they ran out of money. So they're, they can't do anything until they go take on new business. So they're literally robbing Peter to pay Paul, you know, that the phrase we talk about. And so that only lasts so long until you, you basically become locked up and you have no way of paying it because your debt exceeds the new amount of income coming in. So if you learn how to manage your cash flow a lot better and understand financial literacy and business, that will help you a lot more. You won't be spending on stupid stuff. You'll be really focused on, you know, lowering your overhead costs. You'll be looking at how to trim things from your budget. And so that's a big one. I think too many people rely on their, their knowledge base or their skill set, and they think that's going to drive success in their company. Most people that start a company think about this. They learn something from their job or previous skill set that they created, and they're probably pretty good at that. So it gave them enough confidence to go start a business doing that. But what they did is they did not, they underestimated, greatly underestimated the skill of business management, the leadership side of it, to understand that no matter what your knowledge base is and your skill set is, you need to be equally talented in the business management, the business scaling and the financials and the marketing and the sales, like all the business skills have to be there too. So that's why you hire a business coach. That's why you take courses. That's why you just do the reps. Or if you can't do that, and if you can afford it, go hire people that have those individual skill sets that you don't have. I think too many people just rely on their old skills and their old knowledge, but they don't study business. They don't hire coaches and they make a bunch of mistakes and they kind of dog paddle and just do this for years and they never really get ahead. They build themselves a little income, not really making themselves successful because they don't value business skills. They think, well, I'm an entrepreneur. I own a business. I got it. I got it all figured out. But man, there's so many businesses that don't have processes. They don't have systems. They don't understand financials. They don't understand marketing or digital marketing or technology. They don't understand how to even ask for a sale. They think that selling is like, oh, you know, I don't like selling. I don't like pitching. I don't like, what are you doing? Like, are you in business? You're, you're in business to sell, right? You got to learn. This is a skill. It's just like communication, public speaking, salesmanship. Like you got to learn these things. And so invest in the skills that you don't have to become successful in business. And that will greatly, greatly help the results that you're going to have. And you may even find that the business that you started is not going to get you the lifestyle that you wanted. And it's okay to pivot or do something different or start that other business that could potentially get you there because not all business models are created equal and not all of them are going to get you the goals that you want. That's a good point. Some people are, I read a book called the dip and it's about that hmm. uh, different cul-de-sacs. And sometimes we get stuck because we don't want to give up and we're yeah. in the wrong business. But I am so grateful for your time today, Tony. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story and sharing some valuable tips uh, with our viewers. Hopefully, we'll see you again. Hopefully, we'll uh, do this one more time at least. All right. And we're really grateful. Thank you so much. Make Thank it you, a good day.